continue to pray for everyone that's dealing with COVID, amen, especially those that, that are not uh, born again, that God will reveal himself to them through this, amen. I think his whole, his whole actually it's his, it's his wife, his kid, his son, and him, they, the whole family that got COVID. I think the wife and the son are doing a lot better, but Ron's been in the hospital for a couple of days. So. Amen. Ah, my son-in-law, Ed, his brother had open heart surgery. He texted me uh, a couple hours ago. He said it went really good, and they were really excited, better than they actually thought. So prayer works. Prayer works. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's power in prayer. Can you say amen? In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, the Bible says, pray about everything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord. That's what we're doing. Amen. That's what we're doing tonight, church. We believe in the power of prayer, that He answers our prayers according to His will and His timing. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you tonight, God, that you are, God, the, the, the creator of heaven and earth, God. And we pray, God, right now, Lord, that there's nothing too difficult for you, Lord. We pray for those that are sick in the body, whatever sickness, disease, affliction, God, uh, Lord, the COVID, God, all those uh, that are sick with the COVID, God, Lord, that you just pour out your healing virtue, God, right now, Lord. Pour out your spirit of healing, God, and touch those, God. Lord, for those that need jobs, uh, those that need apartments, Lord, uh, Lord, each and every need, Lord, this night we lift it up to you, Lord, because you, we know that you are, God, the God that answers each and every prayer from the smallest to the greatest, God. And we praise you and we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God a clap offering, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Now. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord? Oh, that don't sound like you're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Come on. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God, how many know God is so good? Amen. Well, we just want to welcome you all here tonight. Amen. Because there ain't no place I'd rather be. Come on. Amen. Uh, there ain't no place I'd rather be tonight. Thank you, Jesus. How many know there ain't nothing out there in the world that has it on God? There ain't nothing out there. I, I want to welcome all our Facebook friends and Cyberland friends. And special welcome today to uh, Sister Mary McNeil over yeah. here. Come on. Amen. Praise God. Yeah, I, you know, I see Sister Mary and automatically my mind went into when she was part of the worship team and she'd do the bobbing and wobbing up here. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I've seen that head movement going on and rocking and back and forth. Come on. Amen. God is good. We welcome you, Sister. Uh, Long time part of the family of Praise Chapel Almani. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to go and, and take a look at these uh, uh, announcements for the rest of the week. Um, I'm going to do them in order they're here. So that way I don't miss any of them. But this coming Friday, we have Bible study. Um, how many know that Bible study is an important part of our walk? You know, when, when you look at the Word of God, and how many like to look at the Word of God? Come on, amen. We got to look at the Word of God, right? We got to line up our life with the Word of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts, chapter 2, what, verse 42, is that they gathered together, what, in fellowship, right? In, in doctrine, in uh, breaking of bread, and in prayer. Come on, how many know you get all four of those things in Bible study? Come on, amen. You, you get all four of them in Bible study, amen. You get a chance to be together, fellowship, you get prayer, you get the word, amen. And, you, and you know, there ain't nothing better uh, to be able to do is to be part of that small group. You know, um, more as longer that I have the opportunity to serve the Lord, 
And the more that I look into the Word of God and the more that I hear the Word of God and study and different things, one thing I realize is the importance of the small group. That's why God says when two or three are gathered together, that he's in the very midst. Amen. It's not just a slogan. Come on, amen. It's just not something to get us all goosebumpy up. Amen. It's something to make, bring an importance to our life of how we serve God. Amen. Uh, this coming Saturday, we do have our backpack giveaway at 930. Now, I heard, amen, a little bird say that every one of the cards came back. Come on. So why don't you all give yourself a clap offering. Praise God. Amen. How I many you know that's a tremendous thing? And I heard there was even a little extra involved in that. So you know what? God is always good, and God always takes care of the need. Amen. So uh, 9.30, amen, if you could be part of that uh, backpack giveaway, I know they need some help, amen, and serving the community. So that would be a good thing. Also, Saturday, there's prayer at 8 a.m. before the backpack giveaway. Um, for those of you that are able to be here, amen, I encourage you to be here, to get close to the Lord, to snuggle up to him, amen, and just, you know, allow God to speak to you. Sunday morning, we have our 10 o'clock a.m. service, amen. Uh, and you know what? There ain't... Sunday is the first day of the rest of the week. Come on, amen. It's not the last day. It's not the rest day. It is the rest of the Lord, but it's the first day of the rest of the week. So we look at Wednesday as the hump day, amen, the recharge day. How many know to get recharged, you have to have something to get charged? Come on, amen. So that's where you start off on your Sunday morning, amen, being here and getting just filled with the word of God, amen, filled with the spirit, amen, just to have all the energy to get you through the week or to get you at least to Wednesday, amen. Also this Sunday at 6 p.m., we have church in the park, amen. How many know that the birds are going to be singing, amen, and Praise Chapel will be out there worshiping. Come on, amen. Thank you, Jesus. And then this coming Monday, we're back to the reading schedule for men and women, amen, and those of you that are part of that. So how many know God is in control? Come on, how many really believe that God is in control? Oh, come on. You got to say it with me. God is in control. God is in control. You know, I, I did a group the other day. Um, one of the groups I did this week um, at my job. And, you know, they tell you you're not supposed to be preaching and sharing the word of God, but I just can't help myself. You know? And then at the end of, end of, end of each session, um, they, I have, they have to turn in what they learn. So I don't know, that we're talking about family dynamics, and um, in, in that, somewhere in there, I told him, man, you know what, God's always in control, man, and God's, God's always in charge. And uh, anyways, there was 12 people in my group, I got seven of them, and their remarks of what they learned was God was in control and God is in charge. Because how many know God is good? You got to believe that, amen. You got to receive that, and then you got to live that, amen. Praise God. Pastor Phil, who's doing offering? <laughs> All right. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I am. I am. Stand with me. Amen. Let's worship. Let's worship. Let's worship with our giving. Another form of worship. That's when your real, your heart really shows. Worshiping with the Lord when it comes to giving and tithing. Amen. Because we're here to be grateful of what God does for us. Amen. With our giving. A familiar portion of scripture is Proverbs 3.9 when it comes to giving. We use it all the time. It says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first, first fruit of your increase. Powerful scripture. Honor the Lord. Listen, when you're giving, when you turn in your tithes, you, 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 you're not paying your tithes. It's not a payment. You're giving from the heart. You pay taxes. And that's done forcefully. We don't argue about it because we have to do it. But when you give from your heart, you're honoring God for how good he is. It says honor the Lord with your possessions. What God has given to us, he's asking a portion of it to give back to him. Not that he needs it. He just wants to see our hearts. We're worshiping him right now with their giving. So when you give, do it with honor. Knowing that you could give. Knowing that you're able to honor the Lord and worship him with your giving. Amen? Listen, as you know, there's different uh, ways of giving. Uh, your tithes, your offering, even missions, right? Even to the building fund. Pastor likes to hear that. Giving to the building fund, amen? You could give 
Uh, you could call the church office at 626-452-1673. You could text the word GIVE to 650 985 And you could also log into the, the Tithely app, amen, where you could just log in and put in your offering or your tithing, and it goes straight to, to the church, amen. All this information, you could find it by logging into Praise Chapel in Monte. And you could also keep up with what's going on, amen, with the church. In all, in all the social medias that we use, I mean, Facebook, uh, uh, YouTube, Instagram, and um, SoundCloud, still SoundCloud, I mean, it's still there. In all the praise chapel, I amen, mean, from El Monte. Giving is an honor, church. Amen. Honor the Lord. Worship the Lord with you. I'm going to ask the ladies to come. And one of the ladies is my wife. So I'm going to ask one lady and my wife to come forward. Amen. Ah. If you need an envelope, amen, raise your hand. Amen. And they'll pass it to you. Amen. But honoring the Lord with your giving you. is wonderful, church. You're worshiping God with what God has given to yes. you. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come yes. forward. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We're going to give. Thank you. We're going to give because God is good. When you put in your, your offering, your tithing, you're worshiping. Yes. You're worshiping. You're worshiping the King of Kings. Amen. Oscar, pray for the offering, please. You ready? ready? You want to do old school? Yeah. My whole being praises you, Lord. My whole being praises you, Lord. I feel like I'm doing a concert here. <laughs> As a visible expression, I lift my hands to you, my whole being praises you, Lord. Ever heard that song? Para ustedes que hablan español, todo mi ser. Te alabo, Señor, con todo mi ser, te alabo, Señor, como una expresión visible, yo levanto mis manos a ti. Ooh, that was a high note. Todo mi ser. <laughs> Te alabo, Señor. Come on, give the Lord some praise. Para usted, hermano Jorge, ¿dónde, dónde está? Yes, he's already he's out there? All right, that was a blessing for him. You can be seated, everybody. You can be seated. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get myself together here. Uh, All right. Um, I lost I lost a piece of my message because I have I have them in two different two different places, but um, God will help me. Is that all right? Amen. All right. I want to share something with you uh, tonight. And I want to talk to you about something because a lot of people are going through stuff. A lot of people are in a battle. How many have had a battle recently? You've been in some battles, some struggles. How many have had some attacks on their lives, some attacks from the enemy and stuff, right? How many have some mind battles that are hitting you, okay? All right. I'm feeling better now because I thought it was just me. I thought I'd been tripping for a while, you know. I want to talk about deception. 
Why do I want to talk about deception? Well, because we often think we're pretty good at understanding deception. But we're really not. I've utilized it through maybe the last couple of years, periodically, some little points dealing with the garden. We're going to go back there in just a bit. Because I want to share something with you that I think we not just, we don't just want to hear, we need to hear. Okay? So, um, let me see how I'm going to present this. Um, God desires that we as people, that people on the earth, repent of their sins and come to him. Can you say amen? He, his desire, his number one goal, his number one desire is to seek and to save the lost. We as his children, if we're going to be obedient, it is our job to focus on that very thing. Bringing people to Christ. Can you say amen? amen? At the same time, there are battles that go on in a different manner, in a, in a, in a different way. So I'm going to try and uh, see if I can do this well. I want you to turn to me to the book of Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. I'm going to read, reading, sorry, Brother Will, out of the NIV, out of the NIV translation. 2 Corinthians chapter what? Starting with verse 1. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church about some of the difficulties in them living as resurrected people and the weakness that they have we have it how many know it's really hard to help somebody who won't admit they need help okay that's all i'm going to say right there that's all i'm going to say right there okay let's start reading verse number one and i'll get into that little part of the message later on therefore verse number one since through glory god's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, say rather. rather. Okay, that means, that it's giving you a different point. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Can the church say amen? Yes. We do not use deception, amen. nor do we distort the word of God. No. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, we're open. We let everyone's conscience judge whether we are doing what's right or what's wrong. And even if our gospel, the gospel they preach, was the gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified, resurrected from the, from the grave, him, him uh, 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 nailed to the cross, crucified, died, buried, resurrected from the grave. Even if, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Does anybody remember when you were an unbeliever? Okay. Our minds were blind. When anybody talked to us about God, unless we were in a moment, most of the time our minds were blind to it. Oh, okay, thank you, but no thank you. Okay. So, so that they could not see the light of the gospel. Our minds were blinded. He blinded the minds of unbelievers so they couldn't see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Any servants in this house? Okay. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Are you still with me? But we have this treasure. See, you didn't even know you were rich. You didn't even know you were rich, but you're rich. You're so rich. You're, you're rich. The richness God has put in you is beyond your understanding. And if you really knew how rich you were, you'd walk a little different. 
You talk a little different. You'd act a little different. But I'm not preaching on that. As Pastor Pep has changed a moderation here, that's a freebie for you. Okay? I want to be part of that. I want to be a part of that. So, we have this treasure in jars of clay. He's talking about this treasure of Christ, but it's in these jars of clay. Okay? Clay breaks. Clay is imperfect. Okay? And it shows that this all-surpassing power is from God. It's not from us. All these things that God is doing in our life, the way he uses us, it's from God. It isn't us. Okay? We are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in display, in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down. Matter of fact, sometimes you get knocked down, but you're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life, say his life, may also be revealed in our life, in our mortal bodies. Last verse. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. This is how Paul said it. So death, because of his situation, death keeps knocking on our door, but life is in you. Because the Christ that I have preached and ministered to and taught you, his life in, is in you, and that's a good life. And that's a life that God wants us to have abundantly. Can you say amen? So, so God, God's desire for everyone, for all people, is that, is that we would repent. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us that. I'm not, I have a lot of scripture, but I'm not going to quote a lot of it, okay? So you can write them down, jot it, look, look, it, look it up yourself. At the same time that God wants to move, God wants to touch our lives, minister to our lives, touch people, save your family and your friends and people that you pray for. At the same time, Satan, who the Bible tells us in John 8, is the father of lies, focuses on deceiving. And his desire is to deceive the very people who need to accept the truth. Okay? Verse number four says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbeliever. This is a scripture that we just read when we opened up. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Now we would often think, surely, surely God can stop Satan's lies and give some people a fighting chance. How many want a fighting chance? But this is where we often ask the question, why does it seem like God allows deception? And that's a good question to ask. Let's bow our heads, would you? Let's bow our heads. And let me ask uh, Brother Vince, right where you're at, you don't have to stand. If you, don't, if you can't, my brother, would you pray over this message? Mm, yes. Father, as we speak to our pastor, and you challenge us as disciples and servants of the Lord Christ. Yes. Help us to absorb Hallelujah. the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding Hallelujah. that she is trying to teach us. Yes. Let us get you closer, Lord, in all the things of our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So let's, let's take this journey a little bit here. Okay, so God's Word, the Bible, gives us an illustration or presents to us a, a consistent, not every now and then, but a consistent picture of how sin and deception are related. Okay? What's revealed in the Scripture is revealed through the Word from, from front to back, is that the way, we, the way we tend to think of deceit is, well, a little deceived. We don't always think right. Because we don't always understand. And one of our problems is we don't ask. We don't knock. 
we don't seek. And because we don't ask, knock, or seek, we often never find. Okay? So, spiritually speaking, okay, deception is deeper than just merely being tricked. Have you ever been tricked? Okay, somebody tricks you and that was really cool. You don't say, you deceived me. <laughs> because using the term deception puts, puts it in a, in a different category. Okay, so, so follow me as I, as I kind of give you a little insight before I get... I'm only going to really do one point here. And, and it's, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to help. I want it to help me. So if it'll help me, it's going to help you. Can you say amen? Okay, it's, it's deeper than just being tricked. It's deeper than just being lied to. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If somebody lies, aren't they, aren't they deceiving? Yeah, in a sense, but deception goes further than that because decep you can be deceived with the truth. Amen. How do they do that? Well, they speak the truth to you at a time when it's not the truth that you need. When you already know the truth, you need something else. So in order to be saved... You don't need a particular level of intelligence. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You don't have to, you don't, you, you, you don't need a, a, a philosophical ability. I've said these things before. You've heard me. You don't even need a gallon of wisdom. In Galatians chapter 3 verse number 28. It tells us neither Jew nor Greek, no, excuse me, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave or free, nor there is male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 20, and then verse 26, where Paul tells the Corinthian church, where's the wise person? Where's, where are the people that are always smart? They're the smartest of everyone. Where's the, where's the teacher of the law? Ooh, man, they're, the, they're at the pinnacle up there. Where's the philosopher of this age? In the, next, in the other verse, he says, has not God made foolish the wisdom of man of this world so as a matter of fact all of mankind of which we're part of okay has an has this habit and unfortunately we, we all have it because we're all cut from the same mold of flesh right human flesh everybody get that okay it's unfortunate but what we do is we have this habit of using or thinking that increased knowledge, if I can increase my knowledge, I'll develop a, 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 more, a, a more sophisticated understanding of things. And people think that in this world. If I get a better understanding, I'll know more about sin. You know, somebody came up with a list about, with about a hundred or some, a hundred and some sins that, that, there, that people, most people don't find in the Bible. And people were curious. They wanted to know what they were missing. There's some sins that are not in the Bible. Ooh, somebody tell me about it. Give me a list. They wanted to know. They were curious to see what they were missing. So, one of the keys to understanding warfare, because if you're battling some things, you're in the middle of a war. And it's probably God. It's probably God the reason that that war is taking place in your life. Why? Because war, battle, makes a soldier stronger smarter, more, with more wisdom. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. When, a, when, a young, when a young soldier is placed in a pl platoon with a, or a troop with another group of men and he's never been at war, when they are in war, when they're shipped off and they're dropped in a helicopter or they're off the beach, one of the things that happen is the captain, the, the leader, will, will take somebody with experience that has some experience in war and he'll say, keep him by your side. Till he gets some savvy, till he gets some understanding, till he starts thinking like a soldier realizing this is war. So it is unfortunate, but it happens in life and it happens to us. One of the keys to understanding spiritual de deception is the fact that we often, and this is the first point I'm going to make, it's probably the only point I'm going to get to, that we often, now listen to what I said, don't get offended. Okay? We often choose what we want to believe right. rather than what we should believe. We often make a choice of what we want to believe rather than what we should because we go by what favors 
us. Okay? Even, even when confronted with evidence, even in the face of evidence, we do it and we do it sometimes without even knowing we're doing that. We always want the easy way. Jesus told the, the, the example, parable of, 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 of two ways to enter. There's a straight way, a narrow way, and then there's a broad way. He says, everybody wants to get into the, it's, it's open, it's big. Everybody wants to get into, the, everybody wants to flow through that. That's the easy way to get through. But there's a gate that's really narrow. And your life has to have discipline, and your life has to have some, some divine disciplines. In your, you gotta, you got to be in your word. you got to have some prayer, prayer time in your life. you got to have all these things because, um, you know, it's like going to school. Now, now you, you know this for a fact, that there's, there's some of us that didn't do really well in school. Okay? Because to do really well in school, you had to focus. You had to discipline yourself. You had to do your homework. You had to turn in your reports. Some of us didn't even carry books to school. Right. We don't even know what happened to them. We probably sold them just to get high. Okay? But those who did discipline themselves, those who did go to school on time, those who didn't ditch a couple of times a week, those who did focus in the narrow way of getting through their class and getting good grades, they were able to move on and to move a little further. Those of us that were in the Broadway, there was a party in the parking lot, and that's where we were. Luke 16, verse 31, says, And he said to him, Even if they don't listen to Mo even if they do not, excuse me, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone raises from the dead. He was talking about somebody who had, who had, who had, who had died, well, the rich man dies, he goes to, he's in hell, and he's crying out to Abraham, and he says, you know, send Lazarus to dip his finger in water to cool my tongue, I'm burning here, and he's looking up, and he sees, he says, let me, go, let, let me go back, let me warn my brothers, let me warn my family of this place. And Jesus told him, you know what, even if Moses and the prophets went back, they wouldn't be convinced even if someone was raised from the dead. That's what Jesus did. He rose from the dead. They still didn't believe him. After Jesus had done all these things in John chapter 12, it says uh, all these miraculous signs, and he did it right in their presence, they still would not believe him. Are you following me? Yes. Okay. So, notice in the scripture that they would not believe Christ despite the miracles that were taking place, despite blind eyes being open and deaf mutes speaking and their ears being open to where they could hear and, and people who were, who were paralyzed, who were bound to a bed, who had never walked and, and had walked, all these things, in spite of all these things, they still would not believe in Christ because their unbelief, listen, was willful. So how does this fit in deception? Well, I'll jump ahead a little bit. Because to be deceived means that inside of you, there's still stuff that you've not clarified in your faith. And you're still battling whether you really trust God and whether really the word is actually true to your life. And that's one of the reasons the type of deception that I'm talking about fits in many of our lives. Don't take this as an offense. Let's take it as a, as a warning and an eye opener to us that, that we have to beware because we are all cut out of the same mold of broken flesh, which means that if you find something, fix it. Amen. Can everybody say amen? amen? Okay, so let's go to a great example. I want you to turn with me, if you can, to the book of Genesis. Maybe you can follow along a little bit. Genesis uh, chapter uh, number three. Genesis chapter number three. This is the best example that I can think of, and I'm going to use it a little bit here, so just follow with me if you can. Eve is probably the best, maybe not the best, you could probably think of another, but at this time, Eve is the earliest and clearest example of how spiritual deception really works. Now, for those of you that might be thinking, only Pastor Phil would pick a girl first. Forgive me for offending you, but it all started in the garden. It all started in the garden, and I'm going to focus only on truth. Okay? Are you ready? 
Verse number one. Now I start the car. You got my keys? I'm not scared. <clears throat> now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had that the Lord God had made. He, who? Who's he? The serpent. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat fruit from the trees, plural, in the garden. But God did say, God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And, and, say and, and you must not touch it or you'll die. Everybody see that? So when the serpent asked her, did God really, did God really, did he really say that? Did he, come on. Did he really say that? Eve responds to him in verses 1 through 3 that we just read. She responds by quoting what God had said. That's good. Can you say amen? Is that good? Man, if you quote it, man, that's good. She quotes what God had said. She knows what to do, and she knows what not to do. Adam is not in his place right now. Right. Oh, Adam, oh, Adam, where art thou? So that I don't miss this, let me just say to you, that to this very day, thousands of years later, God, more than a couple thousand years, back into the Old Testament days, just like God was always looking for a man to be where he's supposed to be, doing what God has called him to do, nothing has changed thousands of years later. God still looks for a man. In this story right here, the man ain't there. He's MIA. He's missing in action. He didn't make it to a prayer meeting. He didn't make it to church that week. His golf buddies, now I'm saying this because I love golf, but I haven't golfed in so long and I'm not even convicted anymore. His, his golf buddies probably called him and said, I'll meet you around the big tree and let's hit some balls. She knew what to do. Okay, Eve knows what to do, and she knows what not to do. So then, the serpent tempts her. He then tempts her with what she can gain by eating from the tree. She just got quoted scripture. What did Jesus do in the book of Matthew? What did Jesus do when the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness? And the devil began to, to attack him. And said, you're hungry, you've been fasting, you haven't eaten, you're probably thirsty. Speak to the, command these, command these rocks to be turned into bread. What, what, to be turned into bread. What did Jesus do? He spoke God's word. He quoted the word. Eve, Eve knows what to do. She quoted it to the devil. She quoted it to the serpent. Please, in your mind, don't picture the kukui. In your mind, for those of you cultural people here, do not picture la llorona. Do not picture in your mind, you know, the, 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 the death sentence of things that you think in your mind because Eve was not afraid of the serpent. There was, no, there was no kukui there. She had no problem talking with him. She had no problem being around him. She was comfortable. So just so you'll know that when the devil messes with your life, he's not always a threat. And that's a whole different message. I'm not even going to try and include that here. So the serpent tempts her with what she can gain. Let's look at what it does. Verse number 4 and 5. You ready? So he tells her in verse 4, You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat 
from the tree, from it, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be like God. Now, that was a big one right there. That's a big one. You're going to be like God, and you're going to know good and evil. That had never been said to her or Adam. This conversation is planting seeds in her mind that have never been planted before. Now she's got thoughts. Now it's not the issue of God commanded us. Now it's an issue of what I can get out of this. Our flesh is the same way. Our flesh is the same way. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. So he tells her what she can gain. You're going to know good and you're going to know right and wrong, good and evil. You're going to be like God. Now she's thinking. Now she's not, she's not contemplating. I've, I've been given a commandment not to touch the tree nor the fruit that's in the middle of the garden. But he's telling me something I've never heard before. Eve was lied to. Can you say amen? And the serpent was very cunning. Because that's what he is. And that's what he does. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 3, I was going to use this to open up with, but let me, let me use it right here. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 3, Paul the Apostle says, but I'm afraid, and he's talking to the Corinthian church, but I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds, he's speaking to the church and the people in the Corinthian gathering, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Eve made a decision. Can everybody say amen? Eve ultimately made a choice. She ultimately chose to disobey God. Even though she could quote the command. That God gave her. No different than us today. We, you may not be living in a garden. If you are, bring us some fruit. Not that kind of fruit though. She's living in a perfect place. She's living in a place where, what, what could she, how could she even ask for more? But he planted a seed in her mind. Just like in our situation, you can even know the word of God. You can even, you can even read God's word and quote it to yourself. Mem memorize it in your brain when, when you need help for it. But if there's still something inside of you you've not dealt with, then like Eve, you can be deceived. Again, where's the man? He's not. Where he was supposed to be. Everybody say amen. amen. So ultimately she made a choice. Even though she could quote the command that God gave her without any problem to the serpent with no difficulty. When Eve was confronted, when she was confronted about her sin and her failure, Eve said this around the 13th verse. She said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Okay. In the original Hebrew word for deceived, it's translated to the word trickery, craftiness. He played me. He knew I was weak. And he got me. I didn't want to be gotten, but he got me. I didn't want to be gotten, but I'm gotten now. And he got me. Sometimes that same word is translated to seduce. Oh, see, now that puts a different thought in your eye. That puts a different thought in your mind. Oh, I mean, I can understand tricking, but seduce means something else. That, that was wrong. The devil, that was wrong. What he did, oh, that was wrong. He, listen, listen, listen. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault. Well, who gave him permission to be in that garden? Who do you think? That's right. Remember, his punishment was to be here on earth. And he did something that still happens to this day. 
That word seduction, that's, a very, that, that's, that's an appropriate way to think of the deception that came upon our, 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 our wonderful mother of creation, Eve. She knew full well what God had said because she could quote it verbatim without any difficulty, but she chose. Say she chose. She, chose. she did. She chose to disobey because she wanted something that the serpent cleverly offered to her. Okay, this is the same dynamic that works today, and it works when you're battling something. And it works when you're going through a struggle. And it works when God is orchestrating something in your life so that you'll get stronger, but you don't want to get stronger. You just want it to go away. It's like, it's like joining a, a, a sports team, soccer, volleyball, football, baseball, whatever. And you know, the first couple of weeks, they call it conditioning, right? Football, what it's called, hell week? One of them, it's brutal, okay? It's brutal. I, I, never, I never did that. I never made it through. But I remember watching some of the guys, you know, throwing up because it was so hot in the middle of summer and, and you know, the water breaks and that whole kind of thing. Okay, so, so how does that fit here? Well, it, it fits in a, in a unique way, okay, because when you want something really badly, you don't realize there's a cost to it, okay? So she was, she was seduced by the enemy even though she knew full well what God had said, and she chose to disobey because she wanted something that the serpent cleverly offered to her. That's the, that's the same dynamic that works in our lives today. People who reject God, listen to me, when they reject God, when people reject God, when they reject his truth, say his truth, okay? When they reject his truth or they reject God, they do that, they do so, in, in some way, listen to me, they don't really want to obey him. Because right. there's something that's still in your mind, in your heart, that says, if I do obey God completely, I'm going to lose some things that I've become accustomed to. I'm going to lose some, I'm going to have to relinquish some things that I've, I've kind of made my pet. Kind of made my pet. Like the little chihuahua, the, the little chihuahua, you love that chihuahua so much it doesn't even have to walk. It could be a chihuahua without legs. It could, it could be a chihuahua, which is like a chihuahua burrito. It doesn't even need legs. Why? Because you love it so much, you, wanna, you just want to carry it around with you everywhere you go. There are, there are sins in our lives that can easily beset us. There are sins that we don't think they're really that bad. And... I'm, I'm going to give you a little insight. They may not be that bad, but you have an enemy. You may have a, a habit that's just out of hand. And you know what? It's just a habit, and I'm going to work on it. Amen. Work on it. But while you still have it, you have an open door. It's almost like giving the devil permission to use. Remember when Eve was in the garden, it wasn't the cuckoo scaring her. Woo! Where are you? Woo! He's after me. She wasn't scared. She was familiar with it. She had a conversation with it. We have to be careful. What we familiarize ourselves with. Can the church say amen? We are tempted. I am tempted. You are tempted. Anyone who's in the flesh, we are tempted by our own evil desires. We are tempted by the things that we have inside. Not outside things. There's, there's, stuff all, there's enough stuff inside of us we've got to deal with. Well, I'd have been fine if it wouldn't have been out there. No, no. That thing out there just caused the thing in there to rise up. It's in us already. Our own evil desire. James chapter 1, verse number 14. But each person is tempted. Anybody ever been tempted? Okay, only I raised my hand, so forget you. Each... <laughs> Each person is tempted when they're, when, here, listen to this translation, when they're dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. You know what enticing is like, right? It's what you do with that little chihuahua when they like bacon. When they like bacon and you take a piece of bacon 
and you just put it down here, and that chihuahua knows you got one. He smells it. He knows you got one. He's going to look for that. That's being enticed. Are you hearing me? Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So I don't get it. I don't get it, Pastor. Kind of go back. School me again. I can't go all the way back. But if you were asking why it is that God allows deception, because many times God has to let things happen in our world because you won't pay attention to things. I won't pay attention to things unless he quickens. You know, I, you've probably never been, you probably haven't been hit in a long time. But you know, when somebody hits you, they get your attention. Right? If somebody, if they do it by accident, they got your attention. If you're at your job and you're walking down a hallway and somebody opens, you ever got close to the door when the door opens here in the ladies' restroom? I am so afraid of that door opening one day, bam, hitting me. And I can promise you, they will have my attention fully, fully and absolutely. And, and trying to see how big that bump's going to come on my forehead. Probably hit my nose first because the nose is a little bit, just a little bit further. Not much, just a little bit further out there. Are you following me? You see, all these things work for our good. To reveal things that are inside of us that God wants to help us with. Eve gives us a great example here. And we need, to, we need to be aware of this. Because if you're going through something right now, there's victory for you. There's a victory that already exists. It's already there. It might be there tomorrow for you to see it. It might be there in a couple of days. It might be there tonight. It might be in another week. But there's a victory already there. But what it's not doing, if you're not letting it, you're not letting it reveal. Man, when the enemy comes after you, he's going to reveal things in your heart. Now, I'm your pastor, but I live in the flesh too. And he, he, they, there's things like, oh, I, ooh, ooh. You ever had one of those moments? Ooh, I didn't, I didn't, think, I, I didn't think I had that. I think, ooh, still do. I'm aware now. I need to deal with that. I caught myself. You ever caught yourself? I caught myself. Good. If you caught yourself, good. Pat yourself. No, don't pat yourself in the back. That's a good thing. So, why is this important? Because God wants us to walk in Christ, walking towards that victory. He wants us as believers. When we were unbelievers, our desire was to satisfy ourselves. Satisfying ourselves makes Satan's deception, makes his strategy, makes his opportunity much easier all the more. It's an open gate with a, with a guard dog in there that's dangerous. Okay? But just because we're saved, just because you know Jesus and I know Jesus, doesn't mean that we don't have any 